Um, so, as Emily has said already, I will be talking today about wine and about settler colonialism and about authenticity and uh, indigeneity and how indigenous varieties of wine are having political significance in the region of Israel and Palestine. So the question with which I would like to, uh, to begin is when does a settler become native? And I think that this is one of the most sensitive uh, questions when uh, discussing settler colonialism. Uh, and some scholars had raised those questions. Um, and according to part of them, uh, you cannot ever be uh, becoming native. Because once you are stopped becoming, when you, when you are not a settler, then the whole dichotomy of settler native implodes. And then when the settler stops being a settler, and the native stops being a native, both groups become, or should become, equal citizens. It means that the settler must give up all, all her privileges, material and symbolic, individual or collective. At the same time, decolonization and the process of becoming an equal citizen deprives the native of her symbolic and political position as indigenous. That is the one that naturally, organically, belongs to the place. The moment in which the dichotomy settler native collapses is therefore a life changing for both sides, maybe even terrifying. Now to make things more complicated, what happens when both sides see themselves as the indigenous group and see the others as mere settlers, as in the case of Israel and Palestine? For the Palestinian side, Zionism is a classic settler colonial movement, aiming not only to control the territory, but also to replace the, the local colonized people as its legitimate inhabitants. At the same time, Zionist narratives emphasize the continuity of Jewish presence, talking straightforwardly uh, on the Arab occupation of what is and always has been a Jewish territory. Thus, not only Zionism, according to those narratives, is a legitimate national movement rather than a colonial one, but it also uh, uh, represents the, uh, the uh, authentic indigenous people, while the other inhabitants, the Palestinians, may have some kind of tenure, but, ne but never full ownership. In that, case, in that case, it seems that the threat encapsulated in the collapse of settler native dichotomies is uh, even more radical and threatening. If the Palestinians are colonized and, and yet are not considered as natives, what is left for them? Do they have a place in the world? And if the Jews are colonizers in Israel and Palestine, where is their place of nativity? What is their real place? So we can understand that the two parties are fighting not only over the concrete territory in Israel and Palestine, but also over the Terry story, the story of the territory. That is the cultural political norms of the earth. To whom does the territory belong? And who has the right of authorship? In this young face trace towards both past, history, and present geography, literally the writing of the earth, all proofs are good, yet some are better than others. The political use of archaeology or folklore is well known, however, the relying merely on the past holds its own risks. Usually colonizers would not deny the fact that the native's existence has predated the arrival of the colonizer, yet they will deny the significance of this existence. As, as shows the long history of Terra Nullius. One who wishes to become the legitimate owner of a land then needs to base one's justification on both past and present, to prove at the same time formal, formal belonging and current cultivation and improvement. It is in that context that grapevines and the wines produced from them acquire a political agency. As a natural object with deep cultural significance, the grapevine reveals itself as a site of politics, knowledge, and as a gastropolitical soldier in the race for authenticity in Israel and Palestine. This is the topic of the current lecture, which is part of a, of a research project, project undertaken with Professor Daniel Monterescu from the Central European University. Through questions of territory, terroir, history, and taste, the paper will present a case study in which science, economics, and politics are part of a global market of taste, which is at the same time a local clash of terrorist stories. A case in which genome mapping indigenous knowledge 
sacred texts analysis and modern winemaking are combined in a race for the holy grail of indigeneity. So the paper attempts to present a political biography of a grape. A, a, a biography in which a thousand years old grape variety wakes up one morning and discover, discovers that it is a celebrity. This morning happened on November 2015, when the New York Times publishes an article on a new, I quote, crisp, acidic, and mineral white wine, pleasant and easy to drink, open slightly in the glass with gentle aromas of apple and peach, end of quote. It is not a pleasant taste, however, that brought the story of, the, uh, of this wine, Marawi wine, to the front pages of the New York Times. The title reads, as you can see, that Israel aims to recreate wine that Jesus and King David drank. It then brings the story of a local grape used in the last 1500 years, mainly for eating, which now makes the most interesting Israel wine, to quote, wine, uh, uh, to quote one wine critique, with far-reaching political and cultural effects. And the story is fascinating indeed. Collaboration between a national religious chemist from Ariel University in the heart of the occupied West Bank anonymous Palestinian farmers and commercial winery north of Tel Aviv has led to the creation or recreation of an old new grapevine, an Alt Neu grape. And it's not just a paraphrase on Herzl's Alt Neuland. I think that like the, um, this radical change that Zionism attempted to make to the Jewish people, that is to create a new Jew, active, agentic, and world-making, the the, this grape, Marawi, also known as uh, Hamdani, is presented as re-entering history by being salvaged of its millennia-old passivity and turning into an active agent. The presented case is thus an object-oriented study. Through the political biography of a grape, you would like to describe the political story of a place, but also to ask ontological and epistemological questions. What is the truth of a grape? How can we reveal it? What is counted as legitimate knowledge in the research of that truth and what are its implications, its political implications? As we shall see soon, exposing the truth of the grape demands collaboration between different actors, at times creating an interdependency between various actors whom we would basically posit on the two sides of the political conflict. <coughs> this is the moral. Um, so, uh, in, in a former research, I concentrated on the question of terroir and its geopolitical implications in Israel-Palestine. Do you know what terroir is here in California? Oh, okay, that's well. Okay, ah. I'll explain. Ah. No, it's the, the wine country. So, terroir is a French word describes a set of spatial characteristics of a given place. Geography, geology, climate, and human agricultural traditions that incarnates in the unique taste of its products, usually wine. It is merely a mystical concept, suggesting that a piece of land can possess a holistic and unique quality that is beyond the calculable. Therefore, it can never be fully defined and understood. Paraphrasing on the concept of sense of place, Trubeck refers to terroir as a taste of place. In an article about French wineries, the author explains, the importance of terroir to the French psyche and self-image is difficult to overestimate because it is a concept almost untranslatable, combining soil, weather, region, but also notions of authenticity, genuineness, and particularity, of fruits and home, in contrast to, to globalized products designed to taste the same everywhere. So in contrast to modern perceptions of territory as an abstract legal political entity, Terroir invokes images of organic relations between people and a specific land with a unique character and taste. Understanding territory as a political technology of knowledge and power, that form of research sought to describe how terroir territorializes in the context of the West Bank wineries. Thus, for example, we could find some of the most extreme nationalist radical settlements talking about fine wines about the specific microclimate and the unchangeable terroir as a justification for the location, while other wineries create a whole set of political 
cultural geography, as in the case of Psagot Winery. A winery that destroy, describes itself as a winery that combines Bible and wine. And you can see how they talk about their crops. Our vineyards, they say, do not have an easy life, clearly referring to the difficult lives of the settlers. The vineyard is planted on hard limestone in antique terraces in a Greco-Italian Mediterranean style in the northern Jerusalem hills. In order to help the vine's acclimatization, we drilled holes for each seedling so that it could deepen its roots." End of quote. One must take note of the fact that the terraces are not Palestinian, nor even biblical, but rather Greco-Italian Mediterranean, and how the vine with its difficult life takes root and holds onto the bare rock. Territorializing by means of terroir was used to showcase the supposedly necessary combination of a natural situation elevation type of soil, winds, precipitation, and a distinct human population with a history of wine growing that stretches to biblical times. The removal of any single component in the equation would deconstruct the distinct uh, arrangement and produce a different terroir with different taste. Therefore, the fact that wines from the West Bank receive medals in international competitions, and they actually won quite a lot of medals, allegedly proves that they are not an imitation, but the original. That this terroir is, that it works, that it uh, encapsulates some, some truth in it. Thus, by way of product, the connection between Jews and the West Bank becomes authentic and genuine. Interestingly, though, as this quote shows, the concept of terroir was not only used to emphasize and justify the specific location of the vines and the settlements. It has also created a macro-geographical claim if the terraces of the Psagot winery are in the Greco-Italian Mediterranean style, the message is that, yes, we are on the shores of, the, uh, of this sea, Mediterranean, but we are still more European, Greco-Italian, than Middle Easterners, that is, Arabs. It connects Israel and the West Bank to the civilized part uh, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Mediterranean, the part that knows how to produce high-quality wine from tough conditions and ancient terraces. However, the attempt to Europeize Israel at the West Bank Hills by means of wine washing opens a problem that seems to exist in every colonial imitation. One may be an excellent imitation, yet one will never become the original. Getting back to the settler native dichotomy with which I opened the lecture, imitation of European wines, uh, of European wine tradition leaves the winemakers as losing either way, being no original Europeans, neither original natives. Here the full political agency of the new, of the new wine, the Malawi, is revealed. Let us recall again the formal stage of territorializing by means of the world. The discourse and the wine medals has shown that the West Bank is an excellent place to, to grow to, uh, grapevines. But what type of grapevines? A quick look at the wine of his portfolio is enough. Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Merlot, Pinot Noir, the well-known international varieties that one can find all over the globe. So what does it mean cultural geographically? It means just that some places in the West Bank have a French-like terroir. Nothing but an imitation that will never be as good as the original. No one in Psagot Winery, or in Yeti Winery, or in Livni Winery, uh, or in any of the other tens of wineries in the West Bank, thinks that they would make the next Grand Cru wines, as in, as in France. They can never be better than the original. So in winish language, if you can't make better Cabernet than they make in Bordeaux, why shouldn't you find your own authentic, genuine grapevine, the one that will be full yourself? This twist from place-based to variety-based terroir seems at first sight as an oxymoron. Yet, we should note that this change actually deepens the connection of time and space. An indigenous plant is assumed to be biologically fittest. It is not a human time cycle of agriculture, but rather a biological time cycle in which grape and environment are mutually shaped to make the perfect match of the qualified survival. It has a combination between Darwinian way of thinking and Heideggerian dwelling, 
to make one truth. This really belongs to you. And this um, fact of this logical, uh, ontological claim has an uh, inherent political significance in our case. Based on the fact that Islam forbids the consumption of wine and other alcoholic beverages, supposedly making the wine history a predominantly Jewish story. Therefore, if a grapevine is biologically fittest and makes the existentially perfect dweller of the environment, and if winemaking characterizes only one population in the contested territory, then we can make one plus one and see how the race for, for authenticity in grapevines is also a race for identity and belonging of the settlers' natives. Authenticity also has an economic value. Lucien Carpic, for example, explores the peculiar economies of singularities, asking how can we value uh, something that is unique, since by definition we cannot compare it to anything else. If an object is the one and only of its kind, its value might become infinite. Think, for example, on the last Van Gogh, which was discovered and sold uh, a few months ago in $450 million. So wine, on the one hand, is always unique. A specific combination of place and time, as every harvest year and every terroir change the product. On the other hand, it is still possible to compare Cabernet bottles from different locations and years. Tens of millions of wine bottles are produced every year, and in the end, says Carpic, the value of a given wine is produced by an algorithm of location, say, a Bordeaux, okay, or Bourgogne. and then we have the time, the time of harvest, 1988, 1945, the grade given, let's say 90, and then the question of the grade of the grade, who, who gives, who works. And of course, Robert Parker or Genesis Robinson or other famous wine critics have more value in that sense than uh, the critique in your uh, own local newspaper. So, and the, the economy of terroir or of in, uh, indigeneity plays a major role in that game as scarcity and genuineness clearly raise the value of a product. After all, you might have tens of Grand Cru, but you will have only one wine that King David or Jesus might have drank. Clearly, no one knows what did Jesus drink. The most we can do is a set of deductions. If we can find a type of wine that people used to drink in Israel-Palestine 2,000 years ago, so then it might have been also on Jesus' table. But then, the question that remains is, how can we know that this is the real wine that was drank 2,000 years ago? In other, way, in other words, the variety-based terroir suggests an ontological stability based on the natural selection, but it opens other epistemological problems. First, how can we know what is authentic? That is, what is really original? what really creates a historical continuity from the days of King David to our days. Second question is, how can we bridge the taste gap between the Bible and today? Because we are talking about tastes in the end. To put it bluntly, how many points would Robert Parker give to the wine originally drank by Jesus? If the wine is a bad wine, or at least one that is not suitable to our modern, sophisticated taste, everything collapses. The recreated wine might be of interest for biblical museums, marked as an archaeological story of the past, but not as an active player in the present. In other words, if the modern wine value is the sum of place, time, grade, and the reputation of the judge, then in our case, we still have the same algorithm, but with several twists. First of all, how do you define the boundaries of the authentic place? It is an issue all over the world's wine industry, from the Appellation de Origine Controlée in France to the local AVA maps that you have here in California. Okay, the, it's a political issue, economic issue, exactly what are we talking about when we talk about a place, when we give a name, what does it mean? However, in the case of Israel and Palestine, the boundaries have clear political implications. What exactly is the territory 
that the wine gives significance to. Two, usually when we talk about the time, we talk about the year of the harvest or maybe about the time of aging. In our case, however, we talk about totally different temporalities. Or to quote from the New York Times article with which I uh, opened, I quote, the, uh, the Marau wine was aged for eight months, or depending on how you look at it, at least 1,800 years, end of quote. Time here is not the year of harvest, but rather a combination between antiquity and continuity. It is not a specific year, 1988, but rather a time span of 2,000 years long. The wine's rating sets new problems as well. With what tools should we judge millennia-aged product? Do we have the same taste now and then? Should we try to recreate the exact wine produced in King David wineries? Or should we attempt to make modern wine with old grapes? So these above-mentioned complications in time and space also entail that more experts are needed to complete the algorithm of value. It is not enough to have an estimated wine critique, which refers only to the present of the wine. One needs to also prove the authenticity of the grapevine, of the wine, as well as the continuity during the time span. Yeah, so who, who may expose? Who, who is the wine critique? Are we talking about historians, about DNA uh, researchers? We will see that it is the combination of all of them. But just, just note, how political all these questions sound. What are the borders of the territory? How can you prove continuity in time? What are the relationships between antiquity and modernism? It seems that all of these questions are encapsulated in the story of the grape. So how do you reveal the truth of a grape? How can you determine its real value? As both a natural object and as an artifact. In our case, the solution is suggested by a combination of DNA and genome mapping to trace the biological proofs for originality. Local indigenous knowledge acquired orally from old Palestinian people. Sacred texts analysis, mainly from, uh, from Jewish sources, Mishnah, Talmud, and Halakha, the law books. In order to find details regarding taste, color, alcohol percentage, and production technologies of the ancient wines as a means of uh, uh, trying to make reverse engineering to find the old wines somehow if we know what their color was or how did, how did they call them, etc. And finally, experts uh, in uh, wine tasting, wine reviews in leading journals, and medals awarded in global wine competitions. Those different actors followed their own interests. Yet, those interests converged at a certain point to create the story of the uh, Marawi wine as an indigenous one. The Ashtors did so for the passion of knowledge, for the passion for identity and belonging, for economic search for profit, and for the sake of a good wine and a good story. Our first actor is Dr. Yashiv Drori. Drori is a molecular biologist and a chemist from the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotec Biotechnology at Ariel University an Israeli university located in the settlement of Ariel in the middle of the West Bank. Dori is also a, a national religious man living and running a small winery in another West Bank settlement. He thus doesn't deny the ideological purpose of his research. All our scriptures, he says, are full with wine and with grapes. Before the French were, were even thinking about making wine, we were exporting wine. We have a very ancient identity, and for me, reconstructing this identity is very important. For me, it's a matter of national pride. Drolli collects and characterizes local direct varieties, analyzing and mapping their full genome. Until now, he and his team has found 160 different local varieties of wine, eh, of grapes, sorry, which they define as indigenous to Israel and Palestine. The second layer of his research is chemical analysis and practical experiments in his own wineries, aimed to discover which of those grapes is suitable for winemaking. The third layer is extracting DNA from ancient seeds found in archaeological sites, 
in order to discover which varieties were used thousands of years ago. The final move is to combine the different layers and expose which wines has been drunk, let's say, in the time of King David, um, and then to identify their scientific chemical signature in order to recultivate them today. His search for, for uh, authenticity is based on an organized reasoning. That is, that indigenous grapes and traditional winemaking techniques would be the most suitable for the local conditions. When we asked him, how do you define terroir, he said. You asked him what terroir is. It is the adaptation of a variety to the environment. We are located on the southernmost distribution boundary of the grape. And these are very tough conditions. And what went through the, through the selection, survived and excelled, it probably has, it has it, he said. So the adaptation and selection do not refer solely to the biological variety, but also to the winemaking techniques. Referring to, to the work of a winery in, a, in another settlement in, in South Mount Hevon, on the border of the Judean desert, Drory says, what are they trying to do? They try to grow European grapes in conditions of heat and desert, and they are getting lost all the time. I say, let it go, forget it. Our conditions are, are early coming to fruit, early ripening. Our conditions are heat. Let's use those conditions. Let's do what they used to do here back then. But how would you know what did they do here back then? Or this day, then, here? Okay, these are all political, historical questions. Professor Zohar Amaro is a senior lecturer in Bar Ilan University and an expert on botanical history in the region of Israel Palestine. Amaro and Rory um, wrote a paper together revisiting an old Jewish discussion in the Mishnah on how much wines should be diluted with water before drinking. The common assumption 2,000 years ago was that wines should always be diluted with quite high rates of water. From this fact, Drory and Amal conclude that the old wines have been sweeter and contained more alcohol compared to what we drink today. In order to reverse engineer the old type of wine, they made experiments with grapes that included sun drying them for two days before proceeding with the regular winemaking process. They discovered that the drying process helped keeping the grapes from being spoiled in the hot conditions, and that the result was a strong, very uh, red wine, which can be drank diluted with water and still be tasty and nutritious. So for them, it is a way of discovering what were they drinking 2,000 years ago. What is interesting is that uh, Amar researchers are not limited to all Jewish text analysis. A fluent Arabic reader and speaker, Amar is an expert on uh, Islamic agriculture um, during the, I think, the 16th century, 15th, 16th, I'm not sure about that. Um, and he is also making regular field surveys in order to find the last performance of local, that is, Palestinian knowledge. You need to catch the old people, he says, that they will tell you the names of the grape varieties. I can find special grape species in some Khirbe. Okay, he, he speaks, he combines Arabic and Hebrew at the same time, Khirbe, the ruin, in, in Samaria. But if I can't point at it and say the name, to know its hawiyya, its uh, identity, identity card. So I don't have the context, I have a problem. In order to expose the identity of the grape to reveal its truth, one needs then to combine DNA analysis, historical texts, and local knowledge, which is extracted orally from old farmers, from old Palestinian farmers. Gil Schatzberg, the head winemaker of the winery that made the uh, the, the uh, uh, Marawi wine, the Kanati wine, there, refers to the issue of indigeneity as a good story. We made some noise with the indigenous varieties. To tell you that it makes a better wine, I can't commit. But the story that sells the wine is a good story. You sell to, to Jews that this is the wine that King David drank, and to Christians you sell that this is the wine that Jesus drank. And the day after New York Times 
is making articles, and those articles sell. Schatzberg sees the story of the indigenous wine uh, as a way of making distinction. That is, as a way of raising the economic value by means of emphasizing the uniqueness of the wine. In a global wine market, people might not buy an Israeli Merlot, but they would be curious enough to buy the original distinct variety that grows only in Israel-Palestine. So this um, economic value complements the political interest as it brings drawers and the Mars experiments to light. Without the collaboration with a commercial winery, the discoveries would be limited to academic journals. Yet this ad hoc coalition also has its frictions. For example, Schatzberg has decided that the name Marawi will be written on the wine's label in three uh, languages, including Arabic. It is not a trivial choice in Israel today, and it clearly negates the political project of portraying the wine, the wine industry as a Jewish Israeli only. For Schatzberg, however, the choice signifies, I quote, a philosophy saying that this is a local variety of land, of the people that live here, a variety of the place and not of some kind of politics. For him, the product itself is neutral. In 2013, the famous master of wine, Jensis Robinson, participated of Israeli wines. The wine that received the highest ranking, ranking in an Israeli wines testing, to remind you, was later described by Robinson as the first Palestinian wine she has tasted. It is quite confusing. The wine that made history by getting the highest ever ranking in such tasting was the uh, Hamdani Jamdali. Hamdani is another name for the uh, Marawi, of Kremizan Winery. Kremizan Winery was founded in 1885, a Salesian monastery near the Kirche, much older than most of the Jewish-owned wineries in the region. More, moreover, Kremizan started producing wine for indigenous varieties as early as 2008. That is at least six years before the Israeli side did so. Their indigenous wines portfolio contains a, a, a Jandali, Hamdani, Dabuki, Bituni, and Baladi wines. When asked about the, the Israeli made Marawi wine, Amir Kardosh, from Izan Export Director, replies As usual in Israel, he says, they declare that falafel, trina, tabule, hummus, and now Jandali grapes are an Israeli product. I would like to inform you that these types of grapes are totally Palestinian grapes, grown on Palestinian vineyards. However, as part of a marketing strategy, Kremizan wineries take part in Israeli wine events um, and are published around the globe as an Israeli wine, for example, in a special issue of Wine Spectator dev devoted to the wines of Israel. This is also the source of the confusion. Master of Wine, Jensis Robinson, drank the, the, uh, the Jandali Hamdani wine as part of Israeli wines tasting, chose it as the best Israeli wine, while referring to it later as the first Palestinian wine she had tasted. So in a way, if both sides make the same wine, maybe it is Jensis Robinson that will decide whom does the grapes and the land belong to. Tiger Winery, the second Palestinian winery, today there are two Palestinian wineries, is critical towards this collaborative attitude of Kremizan. Their quest for distinction is straight, straightforwardly political, presenting themselves as the only real Palestinian winery. As you can see, they, they write Palestine on their uh, logo, but they don't write in Arabic. Okay, the, the Israeli wine is writing presenting Arabic on the label, while the Palestinian only writes in English, it is quite interesting, I think. So, what, um, what they say in Taibe is that they, they admit, they say yes, the, the, the Marx in Kermizan and Betlehem still make wine. But the 1967 war and the construction of the separation wall have nearly integrated them on the Israeli side. So, 
we made wine in Palestine because there was no longer wine in Palestine. <coughs> For them, Tromizan is not Palestinian enough. They're not political enough. And like Tromizan's publications and discourse, which hardly mention the occupation, the Huri family, who owns and runs Tiny Winery, refers to the occupation as an, as an a, a inherent part of the story of the wine. The oppressed Palestinian identity the lands that has been confiscated from the family and the winery itself, the checkpoints that disturb ex uh, export marketing, the water scarcity and the inability to plan ahead, all of these become part of the story. Just like the Jewish wineries that tell the story of holding on to the hard work despite the difficulties. <coughs> Thus, the decision to grow indigenous grape varieties is a matter of both necessity and political awareness. In, in, in one article about the, about the winery, it is stated that Huri has also planted his own vineyards, mostly with local grape varieties. Okay, again, the uh, Jandali, Hamdani, Zaini. This is in part due, due to the difficulty of obtaining permits to import vines from outside of Israel, but also has to do with the philosophy of making authentic, uh, authentically Palestinian wine. Today, the Huri family opened, um, they, are, they are trying to uh, make an official decision uh, of the relevant UN committees to, uh, to declare that the Zaini, which is another indigenous variety, is part of Palestinian heritage. Okay, that it should be called uh, only Palestinian, um, and uh, they, they said it is a new 100 Palestinian 